Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Doug Berkey, Executive Director of the Mitchell Institute, and welcome to our Nuclear Deterrence Forum Series. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Robert Super with us today. Dr. Super is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy, supporting the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Capabilities. In this role, he develops strategies, creates policies, and conducts oversight of national nuclear policy, treaty negotiations, and missile defense policy. He was a key architect of both the most recent nuclear posture review and the missile defense review. Previously, Dr. Super served as professional staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee and was the staff lead for the Subcommittee on Strategic Forces. So, sir, with that, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I'd like to start today's session by giving you an opportunity to make a few opening remarks on U.S. nuclear strategy, the future of arms control, and perhaps some of your other top priorities. So, sir, with that, over to you. Doug, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. I appreciate it. I know that this, this uh, 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 Mitchell Institute um, uh, venue is an extension of, uh, of the, the breakfast series that was started by Peter Husey, I, I guess, at least three decades ago. And I would just reiterate what a national treasure it is uh, to be able to, 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 to discuss these issues. I've, I've seen some of the, uh, the excerpts of interviews you've had with Admiral Richard and Admiral um, Hill of the NDA, and, and you've been talking to the service representatives and other material developers. So I think uh, you and your, uh, your viewers uh, understand the importance of nuclear modernization. So I don't want to, to repeat that, although, of course, it is important. I wanted to perhaps spend some time talking more generally about nuclear policy making and the relationship between deterrence, uh, strategy, and politics, and help, help your viewers understand why we have the debates that we have here in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, you could be forgiven for thinking that nuclear weapons policy is fraught with controversy, especially in the U.S. Congress. This is the impression you get when you read the newspapers, but the reality is different. For example, for fiscal year 2020, the year we're in now, Congress provided 98% and 100% of the funding requested for the nuclear enterprise for the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy, respectively. So in fact, modernization is securely underway for each leg of the nuclear triad, as well as the uh, weapons life extension programs and, and the infrastructure projects that are being overseen by NNSA. So we're in a good position there. But look, this isn't to su suggest that our issues are free from controversy. Indeed, the recommendation of the 2018 NPR to modify a small number of W-76 submarine-launched ballistic missile warheads to provide them with lower yields was a large point of contention with Congress and within the broader strategic community. The Democratic chairman of the HASC stated, quote, the decision to deploy the 76-2 warhead remains a misguided and dangerous one. This deployment further increases the potential for miscalculation during a crisis validating the utility of so-called low-yield nuclear weapons and winning a nuclear war adds to the growing pressures of a nuclear arms race. By contrast, the ranking Republican member of the HASC, uh, Mac Thornberry, stated, quote, this deployment enhances U.S. deterrence and tells Russia that any attempt to use nuclear weapons as part of an escalate to de-escalate approach will not be successful. This action is a needed, prudent step to strengthen the security of the U.S. and our allies. So how is it that two senior members of the Armed Services Committee can come to very different conclusions about the 76-2? One believes it's a prudent measure. The other calls it misguided and even dangerous. Can we explain this merely because one has an R and the other a D after his name? Or are there fundamental disagreements about nuclear strategy and deterrence theory informing their views? Look, it's not only politicians who disagree. Nuclear experts across the spectrum of think tanks have opined in dramatically different uh, ways no doubt contributing to the discourse on Capitol Hill. My sense is that these debates over nuclear strategy, policy, and force structure are influenced not only by one's theory of how nuclear deterrence works, but also by various external factors, not necessarily related to matters of strategy or deterrence logic, what I term politics, right? So a few moments on, 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 on policymaking. The conventional wisdom about policymaking, including nuclear policy, suggest that decisions flow from the rational calculation of interests and objectives with a conscious calibration of means and ends. But for those of you who have spent any time in government know, this conventional wisdom is wrong, or at least it's much more complicated. In practice, US nuclear policy is affected by institutional procedures, bureaucratic politics, the push and pull of domestic and international politics, 
individual priorities, interest groups, lobbyists, the media, and even the press of time and events. In fact, there is no pure objective analysis of nuclear policies. Decisions taken by an administration on what nuclear strategy to pursue, what kind and how many nuclear weapons to build, and even when to use nuclear weapons are influenced by a host of factors. For example, the debate over a nuclear no first use policy is influenced by alliance politics. Likewise, the need to reassure allies drives U.S. nuclear force structure requirements and even U.S. nuclear strategy itself. Budgets and domestic politics certainly inform nuclear force structure decisions as much as strategic requirements. And so my point is there is no pure nuclear policy driven only by rational strategic analysis. Let's return to the two different reactions to the 76-2 that I mentioned earlier. I might suggest that Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Thornberry enjoy two very different perspectives on nuclear strategy and that these views are based on the similar assumptions about how nuclear deterrence works. For the sake of this uh, discussion, allow me to offer two basic schools of thought. Simple and complex deterrence. These categories are illustrative and, and scholars in the field use different terminology to, to convey a spectrum of theoretical approaches to deterrence. Simple deterrence, sometimes referred to as minimum deterrence, reckons that deterrence is achieved by maintaining the plausibility of nuclear retaliation, which can be achieved fairly easily with a limited number of nuclear weapons. Deterrence, according to Robert Jervis, a scholar in this field, says that comes from having enough to destroy the other's cities. This capability is an absolute, not a relative one. Bruce Blair, who unfortunately recently passed away, suggested that, quote, deterrence today would remain stable even if retaliation against only 10 cities were assured. For this school of thought, nuclear strategy and the nuclear balance is less important to credible deterrence main, than maintaining the ability to retaliate against the adversary society. Credibility of deterrence is based on creating the fear or chance of uncontrolled nuclear escalation. In the words of Kenneth, Kenneth Waltz, another scholar in the field, quote, the deterrence effects of nuclear weapons derive not from any particular design for their employment in war, but simply from their presence. The other school of thought is complex deterrence. As the name would suggest, this recognizes effective deterrence to be more complicated, requiring an understanding of the adversary, an appreciation for deterrence under varying circumstances and scenarios, and requiring more attention to the types of capabilities and flexibility needed to ensure deterrence credibility in support of broader U.S. strategy. The school of thought pays close attention to the nuclear balance and places a premium upon assuring the survivability of nuclear forces that can threaten what the adversary holds dear. This approach to deterrence has been the basis of U.S. nuclear policy since the 1970s and probably uh, even the 1960s. As Secretary of Defense Schlesinger said in 1975, quote, to be credible and hence effective over the range of possible contingencies, deterrence must rest on many options and on a spectrum of capabilities. Now, back to our two members of Congress. Chairman Smith likely falls into the, into the simple deterrence category, whereas a ranking member Thornberry is in the complex deterrence camp. Chairman Smith likely believes the 76-2 is dangerous because for him, nuclear deterrence and strategic stability are derived from mutual vulnerability, and that for deterrence to be effective, one must make nuclear use as abhorrent as possible. In his view, a low-yield nuclear weapon is designed for nuclear war fighting rather than deterrence, which in turn makes nuclear war more likely. <clears throat> At the very least, the W76-2 is gratuitous for deterrence, at the very worst, it lowers the threshold for nuclear use and makes nuclear war more likely. Mr. Thornberry is likely in the complex deterrence camp. He believes deterrence threats, to be credible, must take into account the views and capabilities of the adversary. And he sees a Russia that is expanding its tactical nuclear weapons capabilities, exercising to a doctrine for limited first use, and is on occasion threatening our allies with nuclear strikes. For him, the low-yield SLBM warhead provides the president with additional nuclear options in a regional context that would deter Russia, Russia's nuclear use in any scenario. For Thornberry, the threat of U.S. nuclear employment on behalf of our allies is made more credible in the eyes of Russia and China when we build capabilities to implement those threats. As NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg put it, 
quote, deterrence starts with resolve. It's not enough to feel it. You have to show it. The WD-76-2 raises the threshold for Russian nuclear use because Russian leaders see that we have taken practical steps to ensure that adversaries can derive no benefit from even limited nuclear use. So there you have it. Two different views about the need for the WD-76-2 based on very dis- different assumptions about how deterrence works. Now, it's difficult to explain these disagreements over the 76-2 only on the basis of deterrence theory, if only because it may be too much of a coincidence that mostly Democratic members oppose while Republican members support the weapon. So perhaps there is an element of politics involved, and one shouldn't discount the role played by interest groups and think tanks. It is perhaps notable that although the 76-2 was controversial, House Democrats supported the modernization of the nuclear triad writ large, programs that were started and endorsed by the Obama administration. So now let's talk a little bit about nuclear strategy. A problem with discussing nuclear strategy and policy is that these terms can be somewhat ambiguous and not everyone uses them the same way. I'm not sure we have a a publicly articulated nuclear strategy per se, but then I'm not quite sure the Navy can articulate a maritime strategy or that the Air Force can explain its quote aerospace strategy. Instead, we usually speak in terms of nuclear weapons roles, principles, employment guidance, and declaratory policy. So let's start with some key principles in declaratory policy as derived from the uh, 2018 Nuclear Posture Review, which if you haven't figured out by now, hews closely to the complex theory of deterrence, as did the 2010 NPR for that matter. So first of all, the highest strategic priority for U.S. nuclear policy is to deter potential adversaries from nuclear attack of any scale. However, deterring nuclear attack is not the sole purpose of nuclear weapons. U.S. nuclear weapons support a broader U.S. national security objectives, such as deterring large-scale conventional aggression, biological and chemical attacks, and reassuring allies against these threats so that they don't seek to acquire nuclear arsenals of their own. Second key principle, U.S. Uh, the U.S. would only consider the employment of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances to defend the vital interests of the United States, its allies and partners. This is the very high bar that must be met before the president, who is the only one that can order the use of nuclear weapons, will contemplate the use of the 76-2 warhead or any nuclear warhead for that. A third often overlooked principle of US nuclear policy and strategy is that the United States will strive to end any conflict and restore deterrence at the lowest level of damage possible for the United States and its allies. In other words, should the adversary employ nuclear weapons in a limited manner in a regional conflict, our objective will be to to deter further nuclear use while seeking to terminate the conflict on advantageous terms for the U.S. and its allies. Now we come to a key point that drives the discussion of nuclear strategy. And by nuclear strategy, I mean the employment of nuclear weapons in support of broader military and strategic objectives, which in turn support political objectives. The objectives of our nuclear strategy are, first and foremost, to deter war, both conventional and nuclear. And second, should nuclear deterrence fail, to deter further nuclear use and hopefully bring the war to an end before the worst imaginable nuclear catastrophe unfolds. To be clear, our nuclear strategy does not rely solely on massive and immediate attacks against the adversary, though we maintain this capability to deter adversaries from contemplating a first strike against the United States. Instead, such attacks, that is massive attacks, would represent the failure of our nuclear strategy. Rather, our nuclear strategy, as articulated in the Nuclear Posture Review, calls for tailored deterrence with flexible capabilities, including an appropriate mix of nuclear capabilities and limited graduated response options, something that every U.S. administration over the past six decades has valued. We cannot know if the strategy will succeed, but it is preferable to a strategy that threatens all-out attack against Russian society, particularly in in response to limited provocations. A strategy of massive retaliation long has been deemed to be incredible in the eyes of our nuclear peers, given our own vulnerability to counterattack. The other disadvantage of a strategy based on large-scale nuclear retaliation is that should nuclear deterrence fail, it must fail totally and catastrophically, as it provides no opportunities to cease escalation well before the destruction of the attacker and defender society. 
Now, critics of a strategy of limited use to restore deterrence will question whether initial use will stay limited. They foresee in the uh, ensuing chaos that both sides will perceive a benefit in escalating to higher levels of violence in the hope of securing victory, or that neither side will be able to control nuclear use, even if they wanted to. But indeed, uncontrollable escalation could occur. But this fact in itself perhaps adds to the deterrence effect at the outset. Look, but one can also imagine that nuclear adversaries will want to make an effort to avoid such a catastrophic exchange. And having broken the nuclear taboo for whatever reason, will now want to do whatever possible to prevent further escalation. Our nuclear strategy provides for this possibility. An alternative strategy of solely threatening large-scale attacks does not. Now, it, it would appear that the Russians may think along these lines as well. In August last month, a very important article was published by a Major General Sterlin of the Russian General Staff. In this article, General Sterlin added some clarification to the Russian decree on nuclear deterrence, which was released in June. In addressing the conditions for nuclear use, Sterlin noted that, quote, the specific actions to be taken in response, and then he says in parentheses, where, when, and how much, will be determined by Russia's military and political leadership depending on the situation. So their use of nuclear weapons will depend on the situation. This suggests that Russia may be interested in limiting escalation rather than resorting immediately to large-scale nuclear attacks. So in summary, U.S. nuclear strategy is one of resolve and restraint. Our limited use of nuclear weapons in response to a Russian or Chinese attack is intended to demonstrate resolve, convincing the adversary that it severely miscalculated when it contemplated the use of nuclear weapons. The strategy also even evinces restraint and sends a message to the adversary that it has much more to lose if it continues down the path of nuclear escalation. The requirements for such a nuclear strategy place a premium on the survivability, flexibility, and readiness of US and allied nuclear capabilities. It re requires a range of delivery systems and nuclear yields. Such a nuclear strategy is based on a complex view of what is needed to deter adversaries under diverse circumstances. A more simple approach to deterrence, by contrast, would assume that merely the existence of a small number of nuclear weapons is sufficient to deter nuclear attacks, and therefore a wide range of capabilities are either not needed or even provocative. So there's certainly more that can be said about nuclear policy and strategy, but let me stop there and reserve time for questions about this and about missile defense and about anything uh, else your, um, your viewers might be interested in asking. Uh, sir, I really appreciate that rundown. The depth of your perspective and insight is, is most impressive. So thank you. Let's dig a little bit deeper into some of the points you mentioned. First, NORTHCOM and NORAD Commander General O'Shaughnessy recently testified that our adversaries have demonstrated the capability, capacity, and intent to hold the U.S. homeland at risk below the nuclear threshold. How is a, the evolving missile threat, which adds hypersonic and cruise missiles to the ballistic missile threat, impacted your thinking about deterrence and missile defense of the homeland? Right, thanks. So when we conducted uh, both the nuclear posture review and the missile defense review, we, um, we drew a distinction between um, uh, nuclear attacks against the homeland and, and, and non-nuclear, right? And if, if Russia or China were to attack us with, uh, with a nuclear weapon, whether it's a hypersonic uh, glide weapon, a cruise missile, a, a, a nuclear SLBM, an underwater nuclear torpedo, nuclear deterrence would, would, would pertain in this situation. And we rely on our, on our nuclear triad and the threat of retaliation. Um, if, if the threat is, is a conventional one, that, that changes the, um, uh, uh, that changes the, the consideration uh, a bit. Uh, and that is that we have, we, have, we have actually faced a threat from conventional uh, Russian strikes in the past. Russia has had uh, conventional sea launch cruise missiles that could have been launched off the coast of the, of the United States. They have air launch cruise missiles that could attack the United States. So being able to defend against these, these threats um, has always been part of our calculation. But uh, the Northcom commander rightfully has been more concerned about this because these threats are actually expanding in number and type. And it's probably part of a Russian or it would be part of a Russian and Chinese strategy 
to prevent us from reinforcing our allies, right? We think about defending uh, ports uh, in, in, in NATO, for instance. Well, we need to also defend the ports of embarkation here in the United States. And so being able to protect these critical uh, capabilities with m missile defense against even uh, conventional cruise missile strikes or conventional ballistic missile strikes is something that we need to pay increasing attention to. Uh, but again, if, if the threat is nuclear armed, go back to nuclear deterrence 101. Right, and so in that sense, I'm not sure a hypersonic uh, missile armed with a nuclear weapon changes the uh, the threat picture much more than what Russia can already do with mm -hmm. ballistic missiles uh, launched by ICBMs or submarine launched ballistic missiles, which also fly at hypersonic speeds. In many ways, it's, it's a back to the future type scenario with uh, with some of these issues. Right. So both the HASC and the SASC fully funded nuclear modernization in their markup of the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act. And you know, as you mentioned, it seems to suggest there's a degree of bipartisan agreement on the need to modernize our nuclear enterprise. And you touched on this before, but if you could go on to it a little bit more, is this a fair assessment? And where do you really see this consensus going? Yeah, I, I really do believe that um, the, the genesis of this consensus can be traced back to uh, first uh, the 2009 Strategic Posture Commission report. Uh, this was chaired by, by James Schlesinger and uh, William Perry. And again, they, they drew this linkage between uh, uh, nuclear modernization and nonproliferation and arms control. This, this, this linkage here uh, was reinforced, I think, during the debate over the New START Treaty in 2010 where again, you, you had a commitment to nuclear modernization as well as um, you know, pursuing arms control, uh, where, where effective arms control were possible. And I think, I think that fundamental consensus was carried through uh, in, in Obama's 2010 nuclear posture review, because uh, you know, in, in that review, they recommended the modernization essentially of each leg of the nuclear triad. And this was again reinforced uh, in the resolution of ratification and the letter from uh, President Obama to, to the U.S. Senate uh, prior to the advice and consent of the, of the New Star Treaty. So there, there is this, this general consensus on modernizing each leg of the nuclear triad, as well as uh, our forward deployed capabilities in the way of B-61 bombs and the dual capable aircraft. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of uh, discussion uh, when um, uh, when the new Congress took over, uh, uh, Chairman Smith raised some very important questions. Uh, do, do we need to have an ICBM leg? Uh, sh should we conduct a new nuclear posture review? Look, I think these are all legitimate questions to be raised. Uh, every two years, we have a, a new set of members that en enter the Congress. Uh, turnover in the Senate is, is, uh, is, is, is less so. But it's always important to discuss these issues. But at the end of the day, uh, Adam Smith asked these questions, but the questions were answered. And, and what came out the other end was uh, support by both Democrats and Republicans, authorizers and appropriators, to fund each leg, the modernization of each leg of the nuclear triad, right? Where the controversy was, was on the W76-2. And I explained that, that reasonable people can disagree about, about how it fits in with our nuclear strategy and uh, depending on how you think about nuclear deterrence, you'll have one view or another. There's some politics involved, of course, but um, those issues were, 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 were discussed, and I'm glad they were discussed, but at the end of the day, the decision was taken by Congress to support the 76-2. And uh, I, would, I would suggest that there are also uh, members, my predecessors, who've had this position in the Obama administration, understand the value of that, understand the strategic logic underpinning that. So while we can differ on the margins, this consensus on the need to, to, um, uh, to recapitalize our nuclear forces to address a, um, a, a, a growing Russian threat in the context of this great power competition, I don't think there's any disagreement whatsoever. And I think the congressional marks bear that out. Now, this year, uh, the HASC and the SASC have marked up They've provided full support again for all these programs. Uh, the uh, House Appropriations Committee uh, took a two billion dollar reduction to the uh, to the um, Department of Energy's request for these capabilities. It's, it's a very large uh, cut. Um, it's going to have tremendous impact on our ability to uh, to modernize the, the nuclear infrastructure. Uh, but I hope that uh, the Senate 
Appropriations Committee will fully fund the request, and that in conference, we'll be able to explain uh, to the, uh, uh, the House appropriators, uh, again, the logic behind uh, this request, point out that these things were funded in the past, for instance, uh, 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 funding uh, the production of plutonium pits. It's something that was supported by the, uh, the Obama administration. Uh, LRSO, um, uh, modernizing, doing life extension programs on the warheads such as the 76, the 61, and the others. These, these things, these, most of what came out of the Trump nuclear posture review was an extension of what was agreed to by the previous administration. Again, where the, where the big change was, was on these supplemental capabilities, primarily the 76-2 and the nuclear sea launch cruise missile. So we're going to have a debate over these, uh, and as we should. But again, at the end of the day, I think, um, I feel pretty comfortable that we're going to end up uh, uh, supporting uh, the, the essence of, of the nuclear triad and the nuclear modernization program, at least as, as long as China and Russia continue uh, to grow their nuclear capabilities. Now, I appreciate that. And, you know, obviously, sticking with the Hill theme here a little bit, continuing resolutions are, are always harmful with the Department of Defense, but particularly when a lot of modernization is underway, it can be particularly uh, difficult. And with things like GBSD in play and other programs, could you please talk to us about how CRs are impacting your, your efforts to modernize the triad? Well, uh, with, with a CR, you're going to have less money than, than what is needed uh, for the program, and that invariably is going to slow down the program. There's no question about it. Uh, GBSD, I think the contract is going to be awarded uh, before the end of this fiscal year. So uh, in terms of, uh, of a new start, we should be covered. But, but if there is a continuing resolution, there will be uh, less money available in 21 than is needed for GBSD as well as the other programs, and it's going to have an impact. There's, there's no question about it. But all programs in the Department of Defense will likely be impacted unless uh, certain anomalies are, are built into that continuing resolution. So looking a little bit broader here, critics often point to Russia and China's nuclear modernization efforts as evidence that the United States' missile defense and nuclear modernization programs are spurring a renewed arms race. How would you respond to that criticism? And as a follow-up, what are Russia and China's primary motivations regarding the vector of their nuclear programs? All right. Well, let's let's um, maybe separate this out. Uh, I, I hear I, I hear the argument, especially when I've when I've been on the Hill, that our missile defense programs are prompting, uh, you know, Russian and and, uh, and Chinese uh, nuclear modernization. But if but if you if you go back and you do the forensics, you'll see that that uh, the, certainly the Russian programs were started well before um, we have uh, uh, deployed these 44 ground-based interceptors to protect the, uh, the homeland. Um, the, the other important thing is, is the Russians, um, and, and some, some, some Russians are probably concerned about our, our nuclear, I'm sorry, our missile defense capabilities, but others, I think they're just using it for political purposes. In the past, uh, Russians have complained uh, about, our, about our missile defense capabilities, and they've threatened that, that there won't be uh, 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 nuclear reductions if we deploy missile defenses. But look at what's happened in, in history. Uh, in 1983, Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative. Um, we, we, uh, there was a prospect that we would deploy you know, huge Astrodome defenses, space-based defenses and the like. But within a few years, we had not only the INF Treaty in 1987, but then we had the New START Treaty uh, in 1991. So there, were, uh, there was the potential for missile defenses, but yet we had arms control. Then in 2002, we pulled out of the, uh, the ABM Treaty. One would have thought that if we pull out of the ABM Treaty, this would lead to a huge arms race. But in fact, we ended up getting the Moscow Treaty, where we went from 6,000 under start to uh, about 2,200 under the Moscow Treaty. So we had both missile defense and arms control. The Russians, uh, when, when the Obama administration was negotiating New START, the Russians insisted that there had to be limits on missile defenses. There were no limits on missile defenses. We managed to to secure a new START agreement, which reduced forces further down to 1,550. So I think the Russians uh, perhaps protest too loudly about this, and they may even be using this because they know they could potentially drive a wedge between our allies and ourselves, and even influence congressional debates over, over nuclear modernization. So um, that's, that's with respect to missile defense. On, on the nuclear side of the house, 
the Russians like to boast that they are about 80 to 90 percent complete with their nuclear recapitalization, their ICBMs, their submarine launch ballistic missiles, and their bombers. So clearly, um, they've been busy recapitalizing their forces, and we haven't yet to get started. So you can't argue that our nuclear programs led to their nuclear modernization. Their modernization has come first. We are now just on the cusp of beginning to move from the concept phase to the engineering phase to start actually procuring these systems. And it won't be until around 2030 that the, the full brunt, the full weight of our nuclear modernization will be witnessed by, uh, by Russia and China. And so you, you can't argue that our nuclear programs are precipitating uh, Russian nuclear programs. Russia, yeah, they've, they've uh, again, in addition to sort of recapitalizing their forces, they're still staying within the, uh, the New START limits. So there is no arms race per se between Russia and the United States, with one important exception, and that is Russia's non-strategic nuclear weapons, or we call these unconstrained nuclear weapons, unconstrained by New START. These are the tactical nuclear weapons, the short-range systems, the torpedoes, the depth charges, the surface air missiles, the uh, sea launch cruise missiles, the ground launch cruise missiles, the air launch cruise missiles that are all nuclear capable. They have today probably more of these unconstrained weapons than they are allowed strategic warheads under New START. So under New START, they're allowed 1,550 warheads. They have more of those available for deployment on, on these uh, uh, theater or, or, or tactical range systems. That's the problem. That's the problem that we face. And that, that, this was what kept us awake at night when we conducted a nuclear posture review, and which led us to the conclusion that in addition to these capabilities, the Russian nuclear doctrine, the way they exercise to this, we had to do something to counter Russia's perceived perception that they could use these weapons to coerce us in a, in a regional conflict. And this led to the recommendation for the 76-2 and to the nuclear sea launch cruise missile. So I'll, I'll say that, again, when it comes to strategic forces, there is no arms race. There's only recapitalization on both sides. Russia is racing to grow its tactical nuclear weapons. We're just starting to tie our sneakers to get into this race. Right? We've got the 76-2, but now we're going to be unveiling the, the nuclear sea launch cruise missile, which is our response to, to Russia's tactical nuclear weapons. We don't need to match them weapon for weapon, uh, but we do need to be able to, to give the president and our regional combatant commanders another option to address uh, these Russian capabilities. So that's our response there. Now, the other um, interesting thing that you raise is China. Right? In the past, China has always been a subset of our nuclear requirements for Russia. As China starts to grow its capabilities, whether they're intending to reach parity, either qualitatively or quantitatively, they're starting to close the gap. They're closing the gap with both Russia and the United States. As they increase their nuclear capabilities, we will have to respond. If we respond, it's gonna impact our relationship, our nuclear balance with Russia. And this is where you could actually see an arms race being precipitated by the growth of Chinese forces. And so we're telling China, we've been telling Russia, let's bring China into these arms control talks. Let's talk about um, why China needs to increase the size of its capabilities. Because at the end of the day, if they increase the size of its nuclear forces, Russia and the United States will have to respond, and they are not going to be any better off. Better to come to the table now and start talking about these things and uh, see how that plays out. I yeah, really appreciate those insights. So what's your view on a no first use policy and what are the implications of such a choice and what would be the impact upon our allies? Yeah, so we have been, uh, Doug, we've been debating no first use since the 1950s, believe it or not. It's not a new concept. It's not a new concept. And um, at the end of the day, the problem with a no first use pledge is that it, it, it lowers the, the risk to adversaries who are contemplating uh, a conventional attack against our allies, right? They may think that they, you know, if they attack us with conventional forces, overwhelming conventional forces, say in the Korean Peninsula, that uh, they could push us back uh, uh, as they did during the first uh, Korean War and that uh, we absolutely will not use nuclear weapons. If that lessens the risk to them, they may, this may encourage them 
to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to, to launch a conventional attack. We don't want to do that. We want to have a level of ambiguity such that they might think that we would use nuclear weapons. So that's why we, 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 we cannot adopt a no first use pledge. But more specifically, our allies have told us this. Both in, in our nuclear posture review and in the previous nuclear posture review, we consulted with our allies. And they told us, do not, do not say no first use. Do not invoke a no first use policy. Again, the purpose is uh, to increase the level of risk that we would use nuclear weapons should uh, an adversary uh, attack us with conventional forces or even biological weapons or chemical weapons. There has to be the threat of, of uh, of, of, uh, of nuclear use. But having said that, remember I told you that our policy is that we only use nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances. Okay. There's gonna be a high bar for nuclear use, right? Now, what is the benefit of a no first use policy? Are, are, are the countries gonna believe us? I don't believe China when they say they have a no first use policy, or maybe they believe that they have a no first use policy, but in extremis, if they have to use nuclear weapons, they will use nuclear weapons first. So I'm not sure what a no first use policy gets you other than maybe in the, in, in the, in the halls of the disarmament community who think that you've, you've now um, made it less likely that anybody would use nuclear weapons because you've pledged not to use nuclear weapons. But I think that pledge is only as good as, as, the, as sort of the piece of paper that it's written on. And uh, at the end of the day, the risks of, of invoking a no first use policy in terms of the nervousness it's going to cause our allies is not worth any potential gain. Uh, certainly an example of peace through strength. The Missile Defense Agency's fiscal 21 budget request paves the way for a new layered homeland ballistic missile defense system to protect against attacks from rogue states. Now, I understand that MDA is planning to conduct an intercept test with an SM-3 Block 2A against a representative ICBM target and is also evaluating the technical feasibility of employing THAAD as part of the architecture. Could you please describe what is driving the need for this approach and how do you envision the Homeland Missile Defense architecture evolving as you look to the future? Thanks, Doug. You know, one of the primary uh, fundamental principles of missile defense is layered missile defense. You wanna be able to intercept a missile in all its phases of flight, boost phase, mid-course, and terminal. You wanna sort of thin the herd to allow subsequent layers of defense to be more effective. Uh, that's easier said than done, right? Because uh, boost phase defense is difficult to accomplish because you have to be at the right place at the right time as the missile is, is launching. You don't have a lot of time. The mid-course phase gives you more time, but the adversary has the ability to deploy decoys and, and uh, penetration aids and the like. Uh, and the terminal phase uh, uh, has certain advantages because these, these penetration aids and decoys are stripped away. But again, these things are coming in very fast and you don't have a lot of time to react to it. But the principle is if you have a layered defense, a layered defense is better than just relying on one phase uh, defense in one phase of flight. And so we have for Homeland Defense, up until now relied primarily on one phase of flight, one layer of defense. That's the mid-course, right? Our ground base, our 44 ground base interceptors intercept in the mid-course phase. What we'd like to do is see if we can um, um, sort of squeeze some extra performance out of our SM-3 Block 2A missile, which is intended for regional defense to defend against medium and intermediate range systems and see if it can provide some uh, some some uh, additional protection, an additional layer, a lower layer of defense to complement the ground-based interceptor, right? And potentially, FAD could do this as well. But as you get to uh, to these systems, the SM3, Block 2A, and FAD, the defensive footprint starts to shrink. So it's not it doesn't provide a, as wide an area of protection as the GDI does. But it does complement it because you have different layers. Uh, what's driving us to consider this uh, more urgently now than in the past, is the fact that the, um, the, the, the modernization of our ground-based interceptors has been delayed. Originally, we were gonna add an additional 20 ground-based interceptors in the middle of the next decade. But due to uh, complications associated with the redesigned kill vehicle and uh, the increase in the threat, uh, the Department of Defense uh, made a decision based on engineering and uh, um, threat estimates to pursue a, um, a next generation interceptor, 
a more capable interceptor. In fact, this interceptor will be new from uh, including, it in, include a new booster as well as a new warhead, uh, I'm sorry, kill vehicle. Uh, and it's truly going to be the next generation system. And as a result of that, it's going to take a little more time. We're going to start introducing that system in 2028, right? And so there, potentially there's a gap, uh, or there's a risk, I should say, between 2025 when we had anticipated having the, the, uh, the additional 20 GVIs in 2028. So, so we don't know exactly what that gap is. We don't know what the risk is because uh, we know that North Korea is planning to increase the size of its ICBM capabilities, maybe even move to a submarine launch ballistic missile, but we don't know the extent of that. So in order to buy down some of that risk, we're gonna look at whether or not the SM32A can perform this underlayer role. We'll conduct a test before the end of this calendar year, and if it works, then figure out some way to, uh, to integrate it into our defense. Um, I'm not sure the, uh, the, the, the plans have been laid out, the concept of operations, but one could contemplate because these are sea-based systems, the initial deployment would occur on ships. And the ships would have to be located in a particular position closer to the U.S. shore in order to provide that, that layer of defense. Of course, this provides complications for the U.S. Navy that, that would want to have its, its, its nuclear ships more forward deployed to, to address conventional threats. And so we'll have to work that out. But eventually, uh, in addition to deploying the SM-32A on ships, you could envision the system being deployed on, uh, on U.S. territory as well. And again, we haven't thought completely through this. We need to figure out first and foremost whether or not this is going to work, and that's going to happen hopefully by the end of, uh, end of this year. And if it does work, now we have a capability to address the North Korean threat. I don't think this is going to pose a threat to... Uh, to a, a, a large nuclear force such as Russia. Again, remember, Russia has under New START 1,550 warheads. We have 44 interceptors. We're going to add uh, another 20 to get up to up to 64 ground-based interceptors, and we'll have uh, a number of SM-32As. Uh, probably in, it, I'm not sure what the total number is, but it's going to be in the low hundreds. And these are systems that are not just going to be deployed for the United States, but spread throughout the regions. So given, given, given the small numbers of GBIs and SM-32As in the underlay, this doesn't pose a threat to Russia. It will, however, help us deal with the North Korean threat. And that's why we're pursuing it. I appreciate that. There have been several rounds of talks between Russia and the United States to extend New START, but the two sides appear to be far apart on several key points. What are some of the issues that need to be addressed with an extension of New START, and how likely do you view progress in some of those areas? Thanks, Doug. I've, I've had the privilege of, uh, of joining um, uh, Ambassador Billingsy, who's a special presidential envoy for arms control, in, uh, uh, on our talks with the Russians in, in Vienna. And... Um, uh, I, I would characterize those talks as being um, very professional. Uh, we've sort of gotten beyond the talking points. We've had good exchange back and forth between the two sides. And uh, in addition to uh, pursuing the um, uh, arms control discussions per se, we're also delving into nuclear doctrine, nuclear policy, nuclear strategy, which of course influences your nuclear force structure, which could influence the way you think about arms control all very helpful, and I think we're making a lot of progress. In fact, I think this article by Major General Sterling that I mentioned, which follows uh, the Russian nuclear decree back in, in June, is potentially a response to, uh, to, to our, our discussions with, with the Russians. So I think we're making progress in that sense. No, I really but, appreciate that. But, 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 but let, me, let me talk more specifically yeah. About, yeah. about New START extension, because I think that there, there is a, um, a misperception, at least in some sectors of the press, that, that, we're not, that the Trump administration is not interested in, in an extension under any circumstances, and we're just going through the motions. Let me quote to you uh, from our um, U.S. ambassador to Moscow, John Sullivan. He said, quote, we are willing to contemplate the extension of the new start, but such an extension will only occur if we agree on a broader framework. Three things here. One, address concerns that we have with Russia's buildup of its unconstrained nuclear weapons, the so-called non-strategic nuclear weapons, which include short and medium range systems. Second, 
strengthen the verification mechanism under the existing New START agreement. And three, enable China's future inclusion in nuclear arms control discussions and ultimately future arms control agreements. So there are some conditions that have been laid out for a possible New START extension. And whether uh, and how uh, uh, Ambassador Billingsley will recommend to the president uh, to pursue a New START extension will depend on how much progress we're making with Russia. We have given them proposals during these meetings, and now we are waiting to see if Russia has the political will now to come talk to us about it. Now, it's a really interesting perspective. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for taking time to share your insights with us today. On behalf of the Mitchell Institute, we wish you the very best in this era of ever-increasing challenges. Now, as a reminder to our listeners, our next Aerospace Nation event will be this coming Monday, September 8th, with Brigadier General Adrian Spain. General Spain is the Director of Plans, Programs, and Analyses, United States Air Forces in Europe and Air Forces Africa. Now, sir, we're going to open the session to questions from the audience who've been listening to our conversation. As a reminder to our listeners, you can participate in the Q&A by raising your hand uh, on, the, on the menu device. When I call on you uh, before asking your questions, please unmute your mic and state your name and affiliation for a guest. You can also submit a question in writing using the Q&A function. So with that, let's uh, see what's in Q&A here. First one here from Joe Gould, a uh, question on GBSD Minuteman 3. The Air Force plan to award the development contract for the GBSD program in August, according to the FY21 budget request. So first question, when will DOD announce the award and is COVID delayed it? And two, if the Minuteman 3 won't be able to penetrate Russian and Chinese missile defenses, is there something they figured out about defeating large number of ICBMs armed with penetration aids? I, I believe that uh, the award will be released before the end of the fiscal year. Right? So the fiscal year ends September 30th. So uh, I don't think COVID has stopped that from, from happening. So that, that's the good news. Um, in terms of uh, being able to penetrate Russian uh, missile defenses and uh, Chinese missile defenses, China, uh, especially Russia, they, uh, again, and this sort of belies their uh, criticism of U.S. missile defenses, they have uh, a, a, a missile defense system of Moscow. It consists now of about 68 uh, nuclear-tipped interceptors. That's uh, the extent of their uh, homeland missile defense system. They also have the S-400, they're building the S-500, which could have some capability against, um, against uh, you know, short, medium-range systems. But uh, given the, uh, the fact they only have 68 interceptors, this poses no threat whatsoever uh, to U.S. retaliatory capabilities. So for us, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, a non, it, it's not a concern. No, I appreciate it. I've got a question here from Rachel Cohen. Good morning. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, so as the Air Force is drawing up its its new conventional nuclear integration uh, sort of strategy, I'm wondering um, if, you know, either you personally or you as, as DOD um, believe that there should be new investment in maybe the Air Force's, um, you know, its own version of a, a low yield, you know, sort of tactical nuke or any other systems that aren't part of the nuclear modernization plan right now. Rachel, every, every morning after I have my cup of coffee, I give thanks that the Air Force is committed to GBSD, LRSO, um, and uh, uh, providing the F-35 with a, um, a nuclear mm -hmm. capability. The Air Force is doing more than its fair share uh, in this area. I don't think they need to do anything more. Oh, and I forgot to mention the significant role and funding they provide for the nuclear command and control effort as well. And, and of course, the, the B-21. Great, we've got a question uh, sent in by Tony Capaccio with uh, Bloomberg. The China report released yesterday implied that the PRC is modifying its snow first use policy by putting some of its silo based force on launch on warning. How significant is this apparent change? And realistically, does the PRC pose a threat of using a nuclear weapon against US versus Russia? Well, again, I, I, uh, I don't 
I, I, I tend to ignore whether they have a no first use policy or not, I, I ignore. You got to look at the forces, you got to look at their strategy, you look at a scenario for, for potential use in, in a regional conflict. And that's how we, uh, we evaluate uh, the, the, the Chinese nuclear threat and, um, and uh, our, 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 the way we tailor our deterrent strategy against them. The fact that they have a launch on warning um, approach uh, bears, uh, bears some, some consideration. We and the Russians have a launch uh, under uh, attack uh, approach, but you know, we also uh, target our uh, ICBMs against an open ocean, right? Uh, I, it's not clear what the, uh, what the Chinese approach is, which is why, again, we need to get them to come back to the table and talk to us so we understand whether their strategic doctrine and exactly what they mean by launch under attack or, or launch on warning. It's an important um, uh, consideration and we need to pay attention to it. Good deal. I've got a question here from General Elder. Uh, there's been interest expressed in having a multilateral nuclear arms control treaty with Russia, China, the UK, and France. How might the US go about reaching such an agreement? Right. Well, that's that's our approach right now. We've we've made it. The, the president has made it clear that uh, there are there are three elements to um, to this new uh, framework for arms control. One is we've got to we've got to address all nuclear warheads, not just the ones that are limited under New Start, right? The strategic systems, but we've got to include the tactical nuclear weapons, what we call the unconstrained systems. They all have to be included. Second is we have to have effective verification. There are ways that we can. There are things that we're proposing to the Russians to. Uh, to help uh, uh, bolster some of the verification provisions under New Start, but any any future agreement uh, must also incorporate uh, uh, effective verification me me mechanisms. And the third element of this new approach has been to to bring China into the discussions. Right, uh, <clears throat> China is growing its nuclear forces. China is uh, is is uh, and, and, and I think the reason they're growing their nuclear forces is because this is part of their approach to becoming a, a great power. They've said quite openly that by 2049, they want to be top dog in the region. And if you're going to be a great power, nuclear weapons are part of that. But they have to understand that if they build up their nuclear capabilities, this is going to impact Russian and U.S. nuclear forces. And at the end of the day, they may be worse off by increasing the size of their nuclear forces, if this precipitates a response or an increase by the US and Russia. And so the approach right now is, is let's talk to, we're talking to Russia, trying to reach some sort of an arrangement, some sort of a framework to include all nuclear warheads, improve our verification techniques, and then figure out how we would then bring China into these discussions and into a, a, an eventual agreement. Now it's possible that the, the Russians uh, would want us to consider the, the UK and the French forces in this as well. And I won't speak uh, for our allies on this, uh, but, but that may, uh, you may eventually see uh, a, a, a much larger multilateral approach as opposed to just a three-way approach that we, um, we think about it right now. I appreciate that. We've got a question here from So Young Kim from Radio Free Asia. He asks, on IAEA's report released yesterday, it said there's no sign North Korea reprocessed spent fuel from its main react nuclear reactor into plutonium in the past year, but it seems to have continued to enrich uranium. Is the U.S. government aware of the latest development in North Korea, and can you comment on the latest with the overall program? Um, I'm, I'm only familiar with this in a very general sense, so uh, I, I would prefer not, not to comment today on that. Yep, no problem. Got a question here from our very own Peter Husey. Uh, he compliments your presentation. And when you look at the present nuclear consensus, uh, do, do you see any possible fissures on that in the future and, and any dangers there? Yeah. So there's, there's always dangers, right? And it's, uh, it, 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 it's politics. It, come, it comes down to politics. Again, I, I think there's a solid consensus on the, on, the, on the deterrence logic that underpins our nuclear strategy that requires a nuclear triad. 
that, that, that is clear. It is clear by, it was made clear by President Obama and it's been made clear by President Trump. And so that consensus should, should hold. Now what's gonna happen though is um, as we start moving from, from the, the conceptual stages and the engineering stages to actually bending metal and procuring submarines and, and, and ICBMs and, and bombers, the budget is gonna go up, right? The share of the DOD budget um, will go up. Right now we spend, we commit about three, three and a half percent of the DOD budget to the nuclear enterprise. At the peak of our modernization, we're gonna probably add another three and a half percent. That's still only about 7% of the DOD budget, but um, this is going to put a lot of pressure on the services, no doubt, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, and we, we, we are gonna to have to figure out how, how to deal with that. And these budget pressures um, create their own dynamics. This is the politics within the building, right? Then there's the politics on Capitol Hill. As these numbers tend to go up, uh, there's more opportunity for, um, for those that take a more simple approach to deterrence as opposed to complex to argue, well, we can't afford this. Uh, we don't need the ICBM leg. We've, you know, we're going to modernize. Let's, let's take care of the, the, uh, the submarine first, maybe do the bomber, and then push the, uh, the ground-based system out, out to the side. So that, that's always going to be a pressure. And uh, I don't foresee that occurring under a uh, 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 Trump administration over the next four years. But if there were to be a new administration, depending on uh, uh, who, are, who, 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 who is a, a appointed in position of authority to make these decisions, you may have these, these types of discussions. But again, that core, that fundamental consensus to go forward with the triad and, the, uh, and, and the, including the LRSO, and the F-35, I think, it's, I think it's solid. I think it's there. Where the arguments are gonna occur are probably on things like no first use, uh, whether to, um, to go forward with a nuclear sea launch cruise missile. Uh, but at the end of the day, I say to my good friend Peter that thanks to, to his efforts, to the Mitchell Institute, to helping to inform people about what's going on. You, you know, when I, when I give my, my little elevator speech to a member of Congress, it's look, the reason that, that, we, uh, that we need to modernize our, our nuclear policy is it's sensible, it's reasonable, and it's affordable. It's sensible because it's, it's a response to the strategic environment. We, we know that Russia is modernizing its capabilities. You just, you've seen the report on China. They are, they are growing their nuclear forces. So this is just a sensible response to, to the strategic environment. It's reasonable because all we're doing essentially, really, is just recapitalizing what we've had in the past. The only new capabilities are the, uh, uh, the W76-2 warhead, which again was just a modest modification of the existing 76 warhead, and the nuclear sea launch cruise missile. So it's, it's, it's actually a very reasonable response. We're, we're not precipitating an arms race. And finally, it is affordable. I just pointed out that at, at the height, this will be 7% of the defense budget. So I think that's, that's affordable, and that's, that's, that's only over, uh, over a certain number of years, and then we return back down to, uh, to our normal funding of about 3 to 3.5%. Three so it's sensible, it's reasonable, and it's affordable. Yeah. Got time for one more, and we'll pick on Dan Leone with the Exchange Monitor. He's asking, when was the last time DOE briefed DOD about the effect of COVID-19 response on the B-6112 and the W-88 Alt 370 programs. Is DOD confident that these refurbs will be done in time to meet the IOC for both weapons? This, uh, this is something that uh, the Nuclear Weapons Council tracks very carefully. Uh, Under Secretary Lord uh, chairs, the, uh, chairs the council uh, and her staff uh, uh, have uh, paid particular attention to this. I regret to say that, that uh, I have not attended those meetings because, because of my other duties, but I do know that they're tracking this very carefully, and I, I don't believe that there have been any COVID-related implications uh, to the life extension programs. Well, sir, we've come to the end of this Nuclear Deterrence Forum session. We thank you very, very much for your time today, and we thank our audience for attending. And from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace day. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate it. Uh, sir, thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.